Eagles HQ in Nashville, Tennessee, to wherever you're cheering on your Tennessee Titans. The So Bros Network presents the unofficial Titans Podcast. Welcome back for another episode of the unofficial Titans podcast right here on So Bros Network. Minds right, asses tight as we tackle training camp 2024. It is underway. Football is back, baby. Of course, I am your host for the unofficial Titans podcast, the EIC at SoBrosNetwork.com, NFL draft and film analyst for stacking the inbox.com, Big Natural Stoney Keeley. You can follow me on Twitter at Stony Keeley. Collectively, we are at Sobros Network on all major social media platforms. Today's show is powered by Memo's Mexican Kitchen. For my money, the best Mexican food in the Nashville area. It's worth the short drive out to Mount Juliet. Memo's is just a mile north of I-40 off the Mount Juliet exit. I just went last week, last Friday night. I got the bowl of birria. It is their, their famous the best birria in the in the in the area in soup form. Yes, you heard that correctly. Pinto beans, onions, birria, that I don't even know what it is, the the broth, whatever that liquid, that good, good stuff is, just in a bowl of that with some cilantro on top. I think it's cilantro. I don't know. I should have checked with that before I'm just saying it on the air like that. But good, good meal. Get the grilled jalapenos. The tortillas come with it. You can make you a little like taco there, get a little heat going. Man, it is so good. The quesabiria, enchilada suizas, it's all fantastic. I just got a notification from Skype in the middle of the ad, but we're just going to keep rolling with it. So I don't know because I don't know what's happening. Nonetheless, that's Memo's Mexican Kitchen out in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. And of course, I'm joined by my co-host for the Unofficial Titans podcast. He is Cinderella Man. One take, O oh, coming to us from the dad zone, outspoken, Owen Reed. Owen, how you doing today, my man? Hey, everybody. Hey, Stoney. Hey, Skype notification. Uh, I'm doing good. We're getting closer and closer to football season, uh, and I'm feeling it. Man, did you, um, did you watch any of the Hall of Fame game last night? I sure did. A lot of football happened. Not good football, but football. (laughs) Is Colin Johnson the next Randy Moss? People are asking. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't go that far. (laughs) Uh, I saw a lot of guys out there that were trying their best. Uh, I don't know if they're – most of them will make the team. The Texans looked really rough on that third-string defense. But I don't think that's going to matter much. Yeah, it was. It felt like a true sicko moment when I'm like into the third quarter and I'm looking for players like maybe I've scouted in previous drafts, like just trying to trying to watch the game and and break it down like formations that are as vanilla as possible that we're never gonna see in the regular season. And they're attempting 58 yard field goals in the Hall of Fame game. I'm like, man, we are we are so back, baby. We are so back. And then, of course, we got a weather delay, and that's when I tuned out. So I admit, for as much of a sicko as our listeners think I am when it comes to this stuff, I did not watch the entire Hall of Fame game. But I did have like a surreal moment sitting in ML Rose out in Mount Juliet last night where I was just kind of like, oh, shit, it's back. Like football is here, man, and and I'm excited about it. I'm excited to uh, to talk training camp, some of the news of the week with you. But just before we start, man, the general vibes, like what are you – how do you feel about this team right now, like a week into training camp? Are you – is the optimism still there, the excitement level still there? What do you think about where this team's at right now, Owen? You know, that's a loaded question, Stoney. Uh you know, I still feel a general sense of optimism. I feel like it's a better team than it was last year, and that's yeah. all you can ask for. But uh, I also feel like there's some some cracks showing a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It was it was an eventful week. I mean, now we have DeAndre Hopkins is sidelined for four to six weeks. Arden Key, uh, Paul Kaharski reported he would be missing six games due to suspension for uh, got popped for Peds. It sounds like that might 
like there still hasn't been an official announcement, so maybe they catch a break there, but debilitating blow to a pass rush unit that was already pretty thin. And then the incident between Jeffrey Simmons and Buck rising, he called him a pussy on live on one Oh four five, the zone. Um, not a good day. And from the reports that we heard, the offense wasn't really looking that good against the defense. Maybe a frustrated Brian Callahan drops in a press conference this week that the negative stuff around here tends to be overblown Man, it just didn't sound like a good day. But at the same time, I I think it's good for this team to kind of face a little adversity. And the angle I'm taking with it is up to this point, it has by and large been all sunshine and rainbows. I know there's some Tavondre Sweat haters out there that have tried to make the conversation miserable. But I feel like the reviews of Brian Callahan, Rand Carthon, Will Levis, Calvin Ridley, the free agent additions, the draft class, everything has been met with glowing reviews so far. So maybe it's a good thing that this team had a couple bad days this week because now you you start to get into that territory where these scraps, these hiccups can build character and you grow from it. What do you think of, of that angle, Owen? How do you feel about how this team can respond to adversity? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the time to make mistakes. You'd rather figure them out in training camp than in the middle of the season. Yeah. So, I mean, you're never thrilled with mistakes and fallbacks and all that kind of stuff happening, but this is the time to do it. Well, let's talk about stepping up a little bit because it's been a theme this week. There's There's been some injuries, first and foremost, what do you what do you think about the DeAndre Hopkins injury? Four to six weeks. Sounds like it he might be available for week one, but it might go into the season. We might not see him until week three. How how big of a blow is that to the receiving core for the Titans? Yeah, I think we're at this point like five and a half weeks out from week one. Yeah. Uh so yeah, I mean, obviously that's a huge blow. That's uh that's your number two guy. Uh, you know, you're obviously hoping that the offense comes full strength. You know, they're not super – it didn't seem like they were super addressing it. Uh, they did have the knee wrapped. Yeah. Uh, but it, it doesn't look major by any means. So hopefully it's not, you know, a long-term issue that we deal with throughout the season. And once again, I mean, a good time to hopefully get it out of the way. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, if we can get this out of the way and get healthy and not have to worry about it, that would be great. You hope it's not one of those nagging situations where you see it with players sometimes where, like, one thing starts, you know, one knee starts acting up a little bit and then the other knee suffers because the player's favoring it. Like, just shut him down. Just shut him down for a few weeks, let him get healthy, and then go into the season at 100%. I hope that's the case, but guys are going to have to step up because, I mean, you mentioned it, Hopkins, a valuable member of this receiving core, uh, one of the key cogs in this passing game. He was the key cog in the passing game last year. He has that chemistry already set with Will Levis. Who are you looking at to emerge in Hopkins' potential absence or at the very least maybe this is a better way of framing the question who do you think can capitalize the most from getting more reps uh with the first team offense man i feel like Traylon burks is really setting himself up for success they said he's put on like you know i don't know if it's 20 pounds of muscle but a lot of muscle uh just looking better looking sharper uh you know he's in that we've called it multiple times already that the prove it year. Yeah. And it seems like uh, at this point he set out to prove it. So I think that's going to be who sets up. I'm with you, man. Like this is kind of, it's almost like a storybook. It's almost poetic how all off season, the, a lot of the talk has been about how improved Traylon Burks has been. And I will say just from watching the camp clips that everybody's shuffling around this week, the nuance to his game is what has been most impressive running comeback routes, post corners, 
things where you have to kind of use nuance to get open a little bit, you know, shaking, shaking the hips one way and moving the other way to get the defensive back to bite. I think that is an advanced, uh, an advanced characteristic of Traylon Burks' game that we haven't seen before. So in addition to that, you you have this hype building. Well, now all of a sudden there's an opening, and it, it's it's an opportunity, and now it's kind of put up or shut up where we are going to see whether or not we were we were right to buy into this Burks hype as he you you'd figure he's going to be the guy that's going to start getting reps in that Hopkins role. I, I don't know, though. Um, there, there is Old Faithful out there still, Owen. I'm going to bring up a name. <laughs> I'm going to bring up a name that uh, has been somewhat polarizing in the Titans fan base. Nick Westbrook-Akine. He's just old reliable. <laughs> old reliable out there. We've written him off year after year, and yet he keeps getting contracts with this team, and he keeps showing up in the big moments. And lo and behold, this week, there have been a few reps come out where NWI is getting open, reliable hands. I, this is a good guy that you want. I, I've I've said it all along. Like you want this guy as your fourth, fifth, sixth receiver. Really good in that role. We've seen him when called upon to be more. He's been a little spotty, but by and large, I think he's a good security blanket, a good safety valve type of wide receiver. Do you give him any shot if they call upon him to to fill the um, the X role that Hopkins is filling? I mean, <clears throat> I, I share your sentiment, maybe not to your full extent. You're the biggest NWI fan I know, <laughs> uh, but I I think like you said that he is a good utility receiver. He's proved that you know throughout his time uh, throughout his time here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if he's going to be you know. And obviously, you're not looking to replace Hopkins at this point. But as far as the spot filler, we need a guy to step up. I don't. I don't see why not. Yeah, I. I mean, I. I kind of wonder if Brian Callahan's going to go platoon mode with this and just give all of these guys a few reps with the first team, just in case, instead of just giving it to one guy. So it, it'll be interesting to kind of watch how the wide receivers are deployed in practice while Hopkins is gone, and then you hope that he's healthy for the start of the regular season and that you're not counting on these guys um, to be something more than what they've been so far. Because I think that's part of the trouble the Titans of the last couple of years have gotten into is that maybe they didn't address the wide receiver position heavily enough and then they got into the season, somebody got hurt, and they were counting on NWI to be the guy. And it's just not an ideal spot. It's not fair to, to, to put those expectations on him. And it's not reliable to move the chains, so to speak. So I, I'm kind of curious to see how the wide receiver usage is going to pan out over the next um, several weeks. The cornerback side of things is really interesting because Cheeto Awuzie, uh goes down with an injury. I, I don't remember off the top of my head how long he's going to be out, but he, he was going to be a, uh, a big part of this defense. He and Legereus need outside corners, locking guys down, physical leadership, all that stuff. Like the, a big focal point of the defense was those two corners. And now it looks like he's going to miss some time and the Titans are having to go back to the well to figure out who's going to be that other outside corner. Now, the logical first choice prior to training camp starting probably would have been Trey Avery. He's an experienced guy in the NFL now. I think Trey Avery's a really good athlete. I think what he has struggled at at times is recognition and, and tracking, quite frankly. And he's had a good summer from a lot of people that have been out there watching OTAs, minicamp, practices, that sort of thing. He's had a good summer. He figures to be the guy that's next in line. But then – they post all these clips from training camp online of these receivers making plays and Trey Avery's on the receiving end of a lot of them. So I, I'm kind of curious as to to where he's at right now, if he can fill that role. And then there's a guy like Jarvis Brownlee Jr., the rookie fourth round pick out of Louisville, who I really liked. He was on my hidden gems list. Uh, if you subscribe to stacking the inbox and receive my coverage of the draft, 
really loved him. Feisty, scrappy cornerback. A lot of people miscast him as an inside guy only as Roger McCreary's backup. I don't think that's the case. I think he can play outside. He's made some plays. He has put some some really good clips out there on on Twitter this week. But a lot of it is playing like the short intermediate underneath stuff, keeping it in front of him where he can kind of crash the throwing window. He he really times his punch perfectly to get that ball out there and prevent the receiver from catching it. He's been really sticky, borderline holding on a few of these plays, but hey, is what it is. I've yet to see a rep somebody's posted where one of these wide receivers has taken him deep, and that's been the question with him is his turn and run ability. But so far, so good, man. Titans fans are waking up to Jarvis Brownlee Jr. this week, as they should. But how do you see um, – and I didn't even talk about a guy like Gabe Judy Lolly, who has been uh, kind of an underdog throughout the summer, former Tennessee volunteer, undrafted guy. I liked him quite a bit. Similar questions to Brownlee, like the the turn and run ability. I, I don't know if it's there, but he's a feisty, scrappy guy. They have some options here in the absence of Cheeto. Who do you see kind of as these these races sort themselves out? Who do you see being that guy for the other cornerback spot? Yeah, I'm kind of with you on Bramley. Uh, I kind of like the hype. I, yeah. I think give the rookie a shot uh, and go for it. Like I said, you know, similar with the Hopkins thing, you're not looking to replace Cheeto, uh, but you're looking for a, a, a prime spot filler in the meanwhile. Uh, I say, why not go with the rookie? I'm with you. Yeah. And um, I'll tell you what, up on SobrosNetwork.com, I've got a quick little piece about Jarvis Brownlee Jr. If you guys want to go dig up my evaluation on him from the spring, watch a couple clips. That's up there on SobrosNetwork.com. Owen, uh, I I also wrote a piece on SobrosNetwork.com this week, just kind of tipping my cap to Malik Willis, man. I, I feel like this is a player – that has really gotten a lot of shit from this fan base. And by all accounts, like he's a really nice guy, really good kid, the type of kid that you want to see succeed, but just hasn't been able to put it all together. He goes out in Nissan stadium and practice in front of what uh, they said. They sold 16,000 tickets. I don't know if 16,000 people actually showed up, but I heard that it was at least 10,000 there. Wow. That's so in front of 10,000 people, he puts on a show, uh, Sean McAvoy posted a series of clips on Twitter showing the uh, the day that he had the throws that he was making. And the thing that impressed me was the anticipation and the placement from Malik Willis, which is not something that we had seen before. The important qualifier, of course, it's practice. You know, you're not taking sacks in practice. I get it, all that stuff. But I at least uh, approach this week saying, hey, let's let's just say good for Malik Willis and let him have a, a good practice, let the people sing his praises for a little bit because he's put up with a lot from Titans fans. I'm happy for the guy for the week, but I'm not going to get carried away and say he should be you know, the backup over Mason Rudolph. I think at the very least, no. if he starts stacking practices like this, maybe give him a couple reps with the twos and see what he can do. But what do you make of the the week that Malik Willis has had, and what do you think it would mean for this franchise if he were to to start putting it all together? Yeah, man, I'm I'm happy he's doing good in practice. Uh, I don't know if that's practically going to turn into anything. Yeah, uh, but it, I mean, I guess it's good for insurance purposes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't see a reality where he ever replaces Mason Rudolph at any point. Uh, you know, but yeah, I mean, why not give him shots with the twos? You know, yeah. that, that's what practice is there for. Yeah, I mean, Brian Callahan said it was going to be a competition. I don't think any of us believed him <laughs> that it would actually be a competition. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's I think it's an important potential camp battle because we we just assume that Will Levis is going to rein in his physical reckless style from – a season ago, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see him out there folding Jalen Ramsey in half on on every play that tends to lead to injury. But if he doesn't, if he's not able to rein that in, well, then I think you're looking at the potential for the quarter or for the backup quarterback to actually play some 
in 2024. So in that context, wh- how important do you think it is for this coaching staff to really get to a point where Mason Rudolph or Malik Willis has has just inevitably, undeniably won that backup quarterback job and they feel comfortable in whoever that is? Yeah, I mean, Will Levis is not a proven commodity by any means. Uh, yeah, you know we like we like what we saw from so far. We think there's room for him to grow, but yeah, by all means, the backup is important, and that's why you know it was nice to go see somebody like uh, Rudolph get signed. Yeah, uh, because he you know didn't have an elite year with uh, Pittsburgh by any means, but did get him at least to the playoffs. Yeah, uh, you know a guy a guy that can go out there and do it. Uh, and I, I just did not feel comfortable having Malik Willis as the second string backup as your best option. I, uh, I'm, but I'm with no, you. No, go ahead. That's all I was going to say. I'm with you on that one. I, I think Mason Rudolph probably played his best ball in 2023, and I think the Titans, based on what they had seen after the 2023 season, uh, you got to go kind of get an upgrade for for Malik Willis. That's all. That's all I was going to add to it. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, Malik is just, I don't know. It was it was a good try. It was a reach when we did it. Uh, I, I don't have personal animosity against him, but no. I've just seen that, that deer in headlights look <laughs> over and over again when it comes time for Sundays. So we we get stuff, little nuggets coming out about – uh, Tavondre Sweat being dominant across the defensive line and just like blowing dudes up. And I'm curious how you process this when I read on Twitter that Tavondre Sweat just completely blew up Lloyd Cushenberry on on a play because I, I think there are two ways to look at it. Man, Sweat is as advertised. That's one. But then there's another one that's like, Oh shit, like is Lloyd Cushenberry not what they signed him to be? Now, I have been a longtime supporter of Tavondre Sweat. I have gone to bat for Tavondre Sweat. He was the 36th ranked player overall on my big board back in the spring. This is exactly what I thought he could do. And so far, so good. I tend to say, hey, I, I tried to tell you guys about this Tavondre Sweat. Nobody acts surprised now. But I do, I would not have expected it against a guy like Lloyd Cushenberry. So I can understand why some people are saying, oh, well, you know, maybe this isn't going to be a much improved offensive line. How do you, how do you process when you hear about these camp battles that are kind of one-sided and, and, and maybe one player's getting the better of the other? Do you just kind of shrug it off as, camp battles or do you think there's something more there for us to analyze i think personally uh <clears throat> that the sweat disrespect has been just you know pretty out of range out of control i'm with you. uh people people see you know the weight issue and the character issues and they're already ready to write him off as a bust yeah uh which just you know it can't be the case yet there's no there's not a bust in training camp, first of all. Uh, but secondly, like, you know, the guy balled out in Texas. Like, Big Jeff was excited to get him. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, people are just so ready to write him off that anytime anything happens involving him, it couldn't possibly be because he's doing good. It has to be because the line's messing up. Yeah. That's that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Is, is, is the hate kind of clouding the judgment? some of these people that are just like, oh, Cushenberry's a bust, the the line's not any better. Um, I, I'm with you. I, I think Sweat, I, I would say confidently with my chest, get used to seeing this, and it don't matter who's on the offensive line. That's that's how I would say it. I'm, I'm excited to see that he is as advertised so far, and the way I framed it this, this offseason with the weight, the conditioning, all that, you just want to see him checking checking boxes. All right, you want to see him get to camp healthy, check that box. He's showing up in camp, you check that box. 
Now let's let's get to the preseason. Let's see if he gets some reps in a game against an offensive line that not his team, and let's see him do it then. If he does it then, you'll check that box, and then we'll go into the season feeling pretty confident about Tavondre Sweat. But I, I like him a lot, and I think this is what you drafted him to be. So don't flip it and be concerned about the offensive line because <laughs> this is – you hope you see this a whole lot more. But since we're talking about the offensive line – it does sound like J.C. Latham is as advertised, um, frustrating Jeffrey Simmons and, you know, getting into a fight with him. That's, I mean, for me, like, that's the shit I like to hear. I'm like, yes, that is our, that's our dog. That's, we, we need guys like that on the offensive line. I'm stoked to hear about it. I've heard Peter Skaronsky has bulked up. I've heard Peter Skaronsky has looked pretty damn good. Lloyd Cushenberry, Tavondre Sweat reps aside, <laughs> been pretty good so far. But the right side, man, it sounds like they're struggling. And it sounds like they have been Sadiq Charles, John Ajukwu as the first team. I've heard mixed things about Ajukwu. And, and I'm a big proponent of a. am sorry, it's Ajukwu. I keep forgetting the, the W is silent. I should have never doubted the great Mike Keith. He's been saying it right all along. John Ajuku. <laughs> John Ajuku's been inconsistent. I, I, I like the guy. I still think he's going to get the job, but they've been working in Jalen Duncan there. Dylan Radens has been at right guard. Sadiq Charles at right guard. Leroy Watson has been playing on the right side. It really seems to me like that is going to be the problem. Uh, that that might keep this offensive line from taking the next step in 2024. But from what I've heard, it sounds like they're kind of willing to take their lumps to get the consistency from that unit and, and gelling with Ajuku and Sadiq Charles. If that's the case, do you think it's better for the long term to build that chemistry? Or are you are you a little concerned that news out of training camp is has not been kind to that right side of the offensive line. Uh, I want to start with the things that I do like about the line. Uh, Let's hear I like hearing that late. I like hearing that Latham's working out, you know, that was another pick that was immediately written off, you know, and not to say that this is, you know, at point proven and that he's going to be that guy, but it's good to see the progress that you wanted to see. Yes. Uh, I think that people often forget with Skaronsky like his intestines were exploding last season. Like <laughs> yeah. he, he went to the hospital and got very, very sick. So even, you know, at whatever percentage he was 50, 70%, he still looked really good. And I'm excited to see what a healthy season, you know, is going to look like for him. I think that, you know, appendix thing was a, a, a rare one-off that kind of, you know, it's one of those things that just happens in life, but you don't expect long-term issues from it. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it's it's going to be good to see uh, him back at full strength. But, yeah, as far as that right side go, it does look rough. I mean, what can you do, though? So you only got one off season to try to fix issues where you can. Uh, the offensive line last year was abysmal. Yeah. I mean, one of the worst in the league. So – the fact that we have any kind of hope, you know, I think is a step forward, and that's that's all you can do, you know, build a little bit at a time. I'm I'm in line with the rumblings, man. Like if you just know you weren't going to be able to fix everything in one off season, which I've heard people say all spring, all summer, you weren't going to be able to fix everything in one off season. I get it. So if you are going to take your lumps on the right side. I think Sadiq Charles is a pretty powerful guard. I think he has experience under Bill Callahan. I think he's probably the logical choice to start there. I like John Ajuku. I know like, I've, I've been a bit of a homer because I scouted him last summer and I said, hey, the Titans got a dog undrafted. This guy could turn into something. So, yes, I am invested for my own personal brand. I want to be right about John Ajuku. But I also think that he fits Bill Callahan's system better than the other options at right tackle right now. Um, Jalen Duncan, super athlete, but it sounds like the writing's on the wall. I I mean, just from what we're hearing, it doesn't really sound like he's getting much run with the ones. NPF just came off the pup list. He'll be back in uh, in the fold. He is probably the most 
athletically talented of these three tackles, but I think there's an element of power missing from his game that John Ajuku offers. And I think that's a guy that has taken advantage of the reps in OTAs, mini camp, and train and training camp so far. And I think you build that continuity. And I, I think if there's if there's upside there, you feel like there's upside with that right side of your line. If you're going to run with Sadiq Charles, if you're going to run with John Ajuku, then I think you just you make that decision and you stick with it so that this unit can gel as five guys becoming one unit. And you're not rotating. There's not a revolving door at tackle. I think you go with that. I think that's the decision to make. But NPF certainly the the puzzle piece here that complicates this because so many seem to think that he's the most talented guy and that he's – I'll shout out our guy at the Hot Read Podcast, JT Runke, because he's been, no matter how hard I try to inflict Ojuku mania on JT, he maintains that NPF is in the pole position for the right tackle job. We'll see how it plays out, Owen, but as far as NPF goes, coming off of the injury, kind of – working back those reps that he didn't get, that he lost to John Ajukwu. How do you think he can impact this race, or or do you think it's just like too far gone and he's missed too much time to get back in it at this point? You know, I try to think about like pre-suspension, uh, how we felt about him, and I feel like the yeah. optimism was high. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, so maybe, you know, with some bounce back, you know, after that adversity, maybe with some time to develop, uh, we can get back to that point. I think there's potential there. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I think that is still a, a situation worth monitoring. And and now that he's off the pup list, be curious to see uh, see how the practices are going. Let's um, let's shift gears and talk about the defense before we get on out of here, because I've been hypercritical of how the Titans address the linebacker position this spring. I hand on my chest. Admittedly, I, I've watched some Kenneth Murray tape when he was with the Chargers, and it didn't do it for me. I, I think, you know, I would have been in the camp of people that called him a bust, um, just based off of what I knew about him at Oklahoma. This this was a guy that played with his hair on fire. And then he goes to the Chargers and he doesn't really pan out and everybody just thinks he's a bust. Well, I started watching some of the Chargers tape and like I said on Football and Other F-Words this week, I was preparing to do a film piece about Murray um, this week and I'm watching the Chargers tape and I'm just, I, I'm like, I don't know what they were trying to do with him. And Brandon Staley, who is now uh, not a head coach <laughs> in the NFL anymore, I just wondered, like, what the fuck was he thinking with Kenneth Murray? And now you're starting to hear rumblings coming out of camp where Denard Wilson is high on this guy. He dropped a bar this week. Everybody's saying, you know, y'all y'all are asking me about the green dot. We want Kenneth Murray to have the green light. And I think that's going to be a big component of this defense is sort of streamlining and simplifying the assignments of the linebackers, specifically Kenneth Murray and Jack Gibbons. But we're also hearing Kenneth Murray is really growing into a leadership role as well, and that other guys on the team are starting to look to him as a leader. I think the word that I can't remember if it was Denard Wilson or Brian Callahan won in a media availability said that Murray is being intentional in that role. And for me personally, I'm starting to piece piece these things together, connecting the dots and I'm like, uh-oh, I might be having to walk back my uh, my pessimism on the Kenneth Murray signing. It sounds like he is is poised to prove a lot of people wrong that weren't a fan of this signing to begin with. And hey, kudos to that guy. As a Titans fan, I love it when guys prove me wrong, but what's your level of optimism like with Kenneth Murray as he continues to emerge in the leadership role? Do you think this is a guy that can solve the linebacker problem for the Titans? Yeah, he's a name that's coming up again over and over. Uh, yeah. I like Denard. Denard loves bringing him up. Uh, 
it does seem like he's kind of stepping up and stepping into a position to do it at least. Yeah, and and it sounds like they recognize where his strengths are, and they have said we want him to be the heat seeking missile. We want him to see ball, get ball. Like don't stop and think about where you need to be. Just be aggressive. And with coaches that can put you in position to do that, theoretically, you know, putting it the execution of this is still something we haven't seen. But as if if there's an understanding of that and that's what they want him to do and he's able to do what he does best yeah I can kind of see how the other things start falling into place where if he starts executing he starts finding success he's productive that rubs off on guys he feels confident when he's confident he exudes that dog mentality that Denard Wilson looks for there's there's like a domino effect with this and it's just stems from just using him in the right way and catering his assignments to his strengths so if you know in theory again we haven't seen them play a down of football yet but in theory this could lead to a resurgence for Kenneth Murray's career and that would be uh fucking awesome for for this defense elsewhere in the linebacking core oh and I I have been like red-pilled into Jack Gibbons and he's taken a lot of flack from this fan base um since entering the league but man there's something to be said for an undrafted guy scrapping and clawing and hanging around um and getting meaningful snaps in game action so i heard brian callahan on the otp with mike keith and amy wells recently when mike keith asked him for a couple of names that kind of stood out to him that maybe he wasn't expecting Uh, whenever he took the head coaching job for the Titans and he named Arden Key and then he named Jack Gibbons and he admitted that he didn't really know a whole lot about Jack Gibbons when he took the job but his energy his intelligence are things that have stood out to him so far that he wasn't necessarily expecting and then he mentioned that Jack Gibbons has an edge about him and he's out there talking a little bit and that is not something that I think a lot of Titans fans equated with with Dr. Gibby So hearing guys, coaches constantly bring his name up, I'm like, okay, I got to go back and watch some of this guy's tape and and figure out if if we're missing something. And watching several games of his, I see it. I'm like, man, I know why coaches love this guy. I mean, it it is literally just a question of athletic ability. I still think Dr. Gibby is not the guy you want turning and running with athletic tight ends. I think smart, creative offensive coordinators are going to try and find ways to play the matchup game and get guys on Dr. Gibby that um, the matchup favors the offense. I think that is still a thing with him, and I don't know how you improve that. I don't know how you improve the athleticism. Maybe this new coaching, uh, the training staff, can un- unlock something within him. But the things that the coaches say, it- it's not bullshit. It's not just blowing smoke. He is where he's supposed to be. Gap integrity. He's a, a sure tackler. He is um, has potential as a blitzer. He-, he plays fast from a processing standpoint. For me, it is literally just the turn and run ability. And I was surprised to see how much Mike Vrabel and Shane Bowen took him off the field in nickel and dime packages. So it's almost like, well, you know what? He's not really in situations where he's going to get run by that often. It's just that when he is, it is potentially catastrophic. Like there was one play in the Browns game when David and Joku just ran right by him. Deshaun Watson didn't see him, of course, because Deshaun Watson is ass didn't see him but if he had seen him it would have been like a 40 yard touchdown to Njoku and so you see stuff like that and you're like oh fuck like we can't have him in positions like that but again I go back to the Kenneth Murray conversation and I say well if the coaches put him in positions where where he's not counted on to do those things maybe they'll be all right with Kenneth Murray and Jack Gibbons at linebacker but how do you feel about Dr. Gibby and do you think the Titans fans have written him off maybe a little too soon. 
Yeah, I kind of feel like he has the 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 stinking stigma of being an old guard guy. Yeah, uh, from the Vrabel days, and you know, just because he was there doesn't mean he sucks. You know, that was a that was a trial by combat uh, roster. Yeah, uh, that was just kind of filling in holes where we saw him. Uh, but you know, if they if they see something in there that they can work with, I think the Kenneth Walker is a is a great comparison. Uh, just get the guy in where he could, you know, play to his strength. I, I think there's potential there. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. And I don't know. Maybe this is just cope. Maybe I'm just coping because they didn't go sign Patrick Queen like I wanted them to. But hey, I've been proven wrong before. I'll be proven wrong again. We'll we'll have to see how that goes. Well. That's all the uh, the notes that I have for today's show, Owen. But I did want to ask you, is there anybody that we haven't talked about yet that you think has stood out so far in training camp that maybe you weren't expecting to? Who are your your camp surprises, if we haven't already talked about them? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of kind of stretching to figure out if I could think of anything. But nothing really comes to mind that we hadn't addressed. What do you have? I, I'm going Kenneth Murray. I'm going Kenneth Murray because it it is it it hasn't shocked me that he's been good because I know he's a great athlete and you can go watch the Oklahoma tape and and see that but it is it has really surprised me that he stepped up in a leadership role and that he's starting to rub off on other guys and it sounds like he's starting to build confidence and that's what's kind of made me take a step back and say oh well maybe they got something with this dude after all I like that too because the media was harping so heavy on the Green Dot conversation over and over and over. Yep. yep. So you know if if it does work out and you fill the void, you know, perfect. They can shut up for a little bit about the damn Green Dot. Are you are you surprised that Cedric Gray, who we kind of thought would be penciled in as one of the starting linebackers, hired mid round draft pick out of North Carolina? There's been nothing on him. And uh, Paul Kaharski talked about him a little bit on the Paul Kaharski podcast this week. The way he framed it was it's probably going to be a while before Cedric Gray's counted upon to do anything like meaningful in this defense. I'm surprised by that because he is a supremely talented guy. And that's part of the conversation that leads me to to like, well, we just better be we be, we better be OK with Kenneth Murray and Jack Gibbons as the two inside linebackers. But I'm I'm surprised to hear that Cedric Gray has has had a really uneventful camp, borderline struggling. It sounds like from multiple multiple people I've I've talked to that have been at camp. Are you surprised by that too? I don't know if I can say surprised just because I didn't have that high of an expectation for him. I know when we did Fair draft enough. him, there was a lot of talk about it, uh, but I can't say that I'm truly surprised. There you go. Well, Owen, you got any uh, any parting thoughts for our our listeners, our supporters? No, that's just that's going to do it for me. We're we're so close, to everybody, fellas. We're almost there. Almost Football's there. right around the corner. Just just keep holding on. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, got to shout out Memo's Mexican Kitchen once more. Again, go on out there, get you a margarita. We we had some watermelon margaritas last week. Fantastic. Katie out there is making some otherworldly gin and tonics. I think I might be the only guy on the planet that goes into the Mexican restaurant and is like, yeah, give me a gin and tonic. But, hey, <laughs> she hooks it up every single time. Uh, great menu. You won't find Mexican food like this anywhere else in Nashville, I'm telling you. I know a couple of you have already been out there. Uh, we went last Friday night, and Katie was like, hey, we've had a, we've had a few people come in, and say they watch the show and and that's such a cool thing. I want you guys to keep going out there and let them know that uh Stony and the Sobros network sent you. So Memo's Mexican Kitchen just about a mile north of I40 off the Mount Juliet exit. It's worth the drive out there and uh if you go try them out, let me know. Let me know and let them know that I sent you. So memosmexicankitchen.com if you want to check out the menu beforehand. He is outspoken Owen Reed, and he's not on social media, but I am at Stony Keeley and at Sobros Network. All of the work at SobrosNetwork.com. We got movie reviews, Titan stuff, uh, all kinds of shit. There's a SummerSlam drinking game up there. If you're a wrestling fan, want to partake, 
that's a good question, Owen. You looking forward to SummerSlam tomorrow night? You got a party lined up? Always looking forward to SummerSlam. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm not sure, but I'll I'll definitely have my eye on it. You think Roman's coming back tomorrow night? God, we can only hope. I'm so sick of fucking Solo Sokoa. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I'm with you. All right. Well, uh, that's going to do it for us. I've got a piece on stacking the inbox about guys that we haven't talked a lot about, but maybe we should. Your Trey Avery's, your Caleb Farley's, that type of player. That's up there at stackingtheinbox.com. And, of course, rate, review, and subscribe to the Unofficial Titans podcast brought to you by Memo's Mexican Kitchen wherever you take in your shows. That's how we get better, and we always want to be better for you guys. For Outspoken Owen Reed, I am Big Natural Stoney Keeley. And until next time, you stay classy, Titans fans.